Hey, it's Mark Podolsk, The Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And Scott Todd, my co-host, I'm excited for today's guest. Are you excited? I'm, uh, I, I can't wait, Mark. I mean, you know, we, we've, had, uh, we've had other guests on. I can't wait to dig in on this one. This is going to be an interesting one. So, look, let us plug away for the first minute, okay? Um, and we'll get the plugs out. So if you don't know who I am, just go to landgeek.com, download the Passive Income Blueprint, subscribe, rate, and review the Art of Passive Income. Um, look, if you're not automating your Craigslist postings, why? Why aren't you doing that? Go to postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek. And if you are interested in automating your payments as a lender with borrowers. Today's podcast is sponsored by LoanGeek.io, the least expensive and most profitable solution on the market. Okay, let's get today's guest. Raj Bhaskar is a software entrepreneur, an angel investor. Let's just say it, he's a big deal. <laughs> okay, Raj. He's really big, Mark. Mark he is the, he's, he's, already, he's already exited once. He's sold out a big software company. And you know, you know what you do when you have millions and millions of dollars? You know what you do, Scott? You find something else. You find something else to do. You get another mountain to climb. You start solving more problems. And then you start you know, helping out the, the youngsters. You start doing angel investing, right? So, Raj, what the heck happened with you? Like, <laughs> I couldn't uh, keep myself busy enough. Um, yeah. Uh, and uh, you guys mentioned you're all, and you're all supposed to buy some real estate too. You do buy real oh, yeah. estate. We'll, yeah. yeah we'll, we'll get you in the land when yeah. you're done with this podcast. <laughs> I'm actually pretty low key. Um, so, but I do like to keep my head down and focus and keep building value. It's something uh, I always knew that I'd love to do. And then uh, even after exiting uh, first company, um, I, I was uh, restless. Like I, I couldn't. I thought maybe I could take a break. I couldn't take a break. I've already been wired since my early years. Okay, so take us from the very beginning, from idea to execution to exit to new idea. Sure, uh, I can even go a step before that. Like I, I was uh, selling candy in the sixth grade, buying a bulk food in the grocery store and selling for ten cents in school. Um, and then the following year, taking it up to like 25 cents to a dollar because I'd only make it available during peak times, like twice, twice a day. Um, and that's like right before school lets out. That's when everyone's really hungry. Um, I didn't know this at the time, even though I was doing it at the time, but you realize like years later, like some of the things you understood in an early age, like the law of supply and demand. Um, and I also knew like I was always, I was always driven to make my own money. I never really cared to spend it. I still don't really care to spend it. I care more about just creating value. And uh, so yeah, I did uh, moved on from that to uh, selling sodas at golf tournaments for a dollar in cash. Um, and, and, and to a point where I was actually paying a friend who had uh, his backyard on a golf course. So I had some costs there uh, in addition to the soda. Uh, and then moving on up to a car detailing business uh, still cash, but even my dad couldn't get me to wash his car for money. Um, I did his car for free, but after I washed everyone else's for money. Um, so yeah. And then college, but, um, I did, uh, you know, I started on my first software venture when I was 23. So a year after working for a wireless software startup, I worked for that wireless software startup in 1999. So we're talking about like Palm threes and Palm fives with a modem attached to them. Um, so not like Zach Morris back in the day, but like you had to pay like a dollar per ping, like to ping a network. Oh yeah. I, I remember those days. <laughs> yeah, Todd. Like a little packet. I, do, yeah. by the packet. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I remember my, my first palm like pilot with the antenna that flipped up, like you would hold it and it, like the antenna would flip up and that would give you, that would give you sailor connection and man, you paid by, you paid you know, buy the megabyte or something. I forgot what it was. I think you got like 25 meg a month of data usage. And I was like very careful. Like, okay, I'll put the antenna down now. <laughs> you know, it's so funny. I miss those days when like I would go to a restaurant and people would talk to each other <laughs> like on their smartphones all the time. They're like looking at screens. You miss those it's days? Like, we, 
Yeah, I mean, we went to dinner the other night, and I'm looking around the table, and like everybody on the in the family's got their phone, me included. Okay, and like we're at dinner, my wife's on her phone. Well, my my kids are on their phone. I'm on my phone, and then my wife says, "Well, I'll just get on my phone because you know you guys are on yours." And I'm like, "No, no, 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 stop, stop, stop!" But by then, it was too late, so there was no there's no getting the, the phone out of her hands. Yeah, so so Raj, you're adding to the excitement. Of, he did it. He it's his fault. It it could I mean, could we blame the lack of attention span on you? On software developers as a whole, I think, yeah. <laughs> now, uh, uh, now yeah, did you, that's did you a, like, when when you started like develop I mean, so you're you're a developer, you know how to develop, right? Like is that something that you taught yourself or how, how did you get that? So I'm actually not a developer. I did do computer science for three semesters, but by the end of the third semester, I was getting the programs from the top two developers in the class in exchange for some debugging help. Um, so I figured I was already essentially running a business, just no money involved. It was time to switch into business. And that's what I did. Fourth semester, I was in business. Um, so, so basically you, you learned how to leverage a, a developer, right? To, to get what you want. Um, and then you, you built this, this empire, right? Yeah. And I go for a mutual benefit in anything that I do. So, um, uh, you know, I was helping the developers debug their programs in exchange for the code. So I helped make their code work. Um, but yeah, I did learn how to really motivate, um, and motivate developers and also how to, um, find the best developers. Um, and so, yeah, when I was 23, I, um, so my last software venture, uh, was a real estate management platform for affordable and subsidized housing. And it was a 10 year venture. That's what it ended up being 10 years and two months. Um, so nothing, it's not a quick flip. Um, it takes a long time to build up value. Uh, I sold it six years ago and still to this day, all the customers and employees are on board. Um, so it's not a house of cards either. So like, how do you build up real long-term lasting value? Um, that's something that I learned, uh, through doing on that 10 year venture. So um, what, what were the biggest takeaways of creating value, yeah. sustaining value? And, you know, obviously the entrepreneurial part of it is it's passive. It's not like you're doing the coding. It's not like you're doing the marketing. It's not like you're doing the selling necessarily. You might've been in the beginning, right? But then you got yourself out of it, which is the whole art of passive income. So what were your big takeaways in the last 10 minutes, 10 years, 10 minutes, 10 years um, of doing that. And then, take, then taking those principles and applying them to the next venture. Yeah. Um, so if we look at like, how do you build long lasting value? So uh, first uh, in that type of business, it involved people. So if you're going to create long lasting value, then you have to, you have to treat people that way. So I always say I'm the same person inside my house as when I walk out the front door which means that I only have one set of values, my personal values, which I apply to business. So I can't justify anything in business. So that means you have to really, what I'm translating is don't, for me, like I didn't view my team members as a means to an end. I view them as they're, they're part of the team and we're all going along the same journey. And I can't just like, you know, they're my family too, right? So you have your, your work family and you have your, your related family. Um, your related family you don't pick right um, but you can pick your work family and um, that's that's the first part of how do you create long-lasting values you you align yourself yourself with the right people uh, and you treat them that way you treat them long term not transactional right transactional things you can do on Amazon you don't need to do transactional things with people um, so that's the first part and then the second part is applying the that same principle to your customers Right? So you view your customers as long-term, not as a source of income. Uh, sounds counter, it's counterintuitive, but uh, it's really like, if you go back to your personal values, every one of us is a consumer when we're at home, right? We all have the experience of being a consumer, but I find so many business owners who really have a double standard when it comes to customer service as a consumer, that business owner expects like the best customer service on earth and they get really pissed off when they don't get good service. But a lot of those folks in their own business, they don't have that same level of customer service. And it, 
you know, that's a, when you look at long-term, when I look back, those are the things it's like, bring on the best people and then take care of your customers, which seems simple. It actually costs a lot of money up front to do that. You know, what's so interesting about that is when I first started, I really, um, my biggest mistake, my biggest regret in business is doing exactly the opposite of what you just stated. So I treated all my customers as a transaction. They were not long-term relationships at all. They're just buying and flipping land, buying and flipping land. It didn't matter, right? Like I wasn't good. I didn't think I would ever hear from those people again. Um, number one. Number two, I did everything myself. I didn't even have a relationship with other people. I was completely, I had such strong relationship issues for the first six years. And now I look back, I'm like, what was I doing? So what I was, you know, I, I didn't know what I didn't know. Um, and so now today, luckily, I'm smart enough or humble enough or whatever it is to take that long-term approach. Um, but I, I agree with you. Like, I do see it happening a lot. And it happens to me. Like, you feel like a transaction and it's like visceral, right? Scott Todd, have you had those experiences? Yeah, I, I have. And, uh, you know, I, I can see what, what you're saying too about like just starting out because I think when you start off, like anything, especially in like what we do too, sometimes you're like in disbelief, like I better run. I better run and hide from this guy so that he doesn't come back to me, even though what we do is all legitimate. It's just, it's just hard to put our brains around, you know, like that this is real. Um, and then I think that sometimes um, we some, like, especially when you get into real estate and like real estate investing, you don't necessarily think like the, the fact that someone's going to maybe buy multiple properties from you because the way that we, the way that we think is, you know, I buy my house and then I'm done for seven years. And so realtors are always having to start over again, you know? Um, so if, if you just, if I just walked in my own shoes as a, as a real estate consumer, I'd be like, I, I, I did a transaction with this realtor and I'm done with them. Um, and maybe if I liked them, I'd go back to them, but you know, it's really about, you know, I, today I still have customers that come back to me and I upgrade them. It's amazing that you can upgrade them on a real estate investment. Yeah. You know, what's so funny is, is that, you know, I want to transition now to realtors because Raj actually you know, has a solution specifically for realtors. And what I'd like to know, Raj, is what is that solution and why did you come up with it? Sure. Uh, so we have a mobile app called uh, Profit Dash, which is a, it's a spinoff of our Hurdler app. And it's basically a mobile app for realtors to easily manage all of their business finances and business finances for a realtor. A lot of it's like personal related finance because realtors, most realtors are, are uh, in charge of their own finance. I mean, they're in charge of their taxes too for their business. They're independent agents that typically associate themselves with the brokerage. Um, so it tracks uh, all of their business income, their expenses that turn into deductions, and it even provides them real-time income tax estimates for all 50 states in DC. Um, so they know what they actually get to keep at the end of the day, which is what I call your true profit. Like for an independent you know, a person, like your true profit is what you get to keep after your expenses and taxes. Like that's your take home pay. I think that's an important number to know, not just uh, your, you know, the net profit, which, which most businesses uh, track. As a person, you want to know what you actually get to keep at the end of the day, because that's what you'll probably have available to spend on the rest of your lifestyle. I love it, but you're not a realtor. Uh, no, I'm not. Um, and so my vision for Hurdler initially, my co-founder and I was basically, how do we help the millions of entrepreneurs out there do their thing, grow their business? And how do we get this ugly thing of accounting and taxes like out of their way so they can continue growing? Right. Because, um, that's something like even in my previous business, I had a controller on staff in time and, and we had our own accounting system and, but you know, it was interesting after, after uh, we exited that, like nothing had really changed in the accounting space. Like all that happened was software moved from windows to the web, which didn't really change much, but mobile was just starting to take shape and all the numbers showed that mobile growth was going to be crazy. And then you had this other thing with 
you know, the modern entrepreneur has multiple income streams, right? It could be from passive investments, could be active, uh, but multiple income streams, right? We have folks that are Uber drivers that also are Airbnb hosts on the weekend. Um, they do freelance they, on the side. So two, three, four different things coming in. How do you track all that and not leave uh, key expense deductions on the table? Um, and realtors happen to be, uh, they, I mean, they're one of the largest group of independent professionals in the, com- in the country. Um, so what, yeah. what's the big objection that you get? Is it, hey, why don't I just use QuickBooks? No? Sure. Uh, so there's, I mean, there's, we do mileage tracking as well. So there's no shortage of, let's say, mileage trackers, expense trackers. There's, there's TurboTax for filing taxes. You could use five different apps. Uh, part of our vision was really, how do I, as an entrepreneur, how am I going to save time? The way I'm going to save time is if all of this is together in one mobile app. And if you look at software in general, that's how it started. Even on Windows, they had five different apps or something. And then in time, you got one system that could handle everything. And that's what we're trying to achieve on mobile. It's like, how do you take a client to Starbucks and in two seconds, right off that expense, just two seconds of your time, which means you save half of that $8 expense. So if I can get a 50% off coupon to Starbucks for two seconds of my time, every time, I think that's a fair trade off for two seconds of my time. It's, it's amazing. I mean, I, you know, I put everything on, on a couple business credit cards and then my accountant or my bookkeeper emails me and says, Mark, what's this? What's this? What's this? To make yeah, sure it's classified correctly. <laughs> And how much is my time worth? Well, I can always make more money, Raj. I can't get more time. Yeah. I think, I think I'm a customer. Yep. Scott Todd, I think, I think you're a customer. So I, think, I think we could all be customers. You got a big market there, Raj. Yeah, there's a, a last numbers I saw like in I think a few more years, there'll be 50 million um, folks with significant 1099 income, a freelance income, even if it's not 1099. I mean, any business owner... It's not running a Delaware C corporation, which is, which is like majority of business owners. Um, that's all pass through, right? You're, you're in charge of your own taxes. It all affects your personal finances. So, you know, if you're going to grow a business, you got to know your numbers. So this is all real time. Like I can't imagine, at least for me, like I got to know everything that's going on if I'm going to grow a, grow a business. I love it. I love it. Scott Todd, you're a numbers guy. Let's poke some yeah, holes in the garage. I, I don't know. I don't really see any holes right now. I, I think that, um, you know, I think that, um, I, I, like, how, how do you, how do you scale in a, in an environment, like a competitive environment? Like, I mean, it's very competitive, right? Like, how are you, how are you able to break through the noise and stand out amongst, you know, all the competition that, that kind of does the same thing? So uh, there isn't that much competition uh, that does the same thing, uh, but I do agree that. So one challenge that you have is like, um, you know, a person, you know, any of us, if we're looking, if we're looking for a mobile app, uh, that you know, you can search for anything on the app store and you'll get a hundred results, and they would all appear to do the same thing, even if they don't. And people will only spend a second or two to decide which one they're going to tap on, or they might just leave all together without downloading anything. Um, so that's very tricky. Um, so I think if we get down to it, it's really, yeah, the differentiation and how do you do distribution and things like that. Uh, for a realtor one, uh, we have a, a solid value proposition that stands on its own. And that's something that, so Keller Williams, the largest real estate franchise in the world by agent count, um, it resonated with them and we partnered with them and launched it uh, recently um, through them. Um, and so I think we'll probably see uh, some partnerships like that where we partner with a leader in the space to, to help get us going in that particular vertical. Um, but I also, you know, and that, that, I guess that ties back to people too, right? Because um, you have a large class of, of folks out there, especially millennials that really, um, they want to identify with like, everything they use, like whether it's a brand or what have you, like it has to feel good to them, not just do what the function is, but it has to feel good to them. And I think uh, that's a long-term play that we're going after. Um, and I don't see too many companies doing that. I think uh, there's a market inflection coming and, or market correction, as they say. Uh, and I think we'll see a lot of companies go away. Um, so I think those, uh, 
you know, we're trying to differentiate ourselves with a long-term focus. Um, yeah. You know, so I think going deep in verticals is very helpful. Um, so we've done that in real estate in particular. So, but you're not, I mean, like you're not just putting an app in the app store and letting people find it. You're, you're being proactive and you're going out and like connecting with like a Kel, Keller Williams, for example, you're, you're going out there and connecting them with them. Right. And if, if I'm correct, I mean, that's even when you built your other business, you didn't, you didn't just sit idle and wait for them to come. You're out there, you're hustling, right? Like you're out there finding, finding buyers, finding customers. How do you do that? Yeah. I mean, in my other business, I cold called what I call the housing 500, the 500 largest housing agencies in the country. I spent a whole summer and literally cold called every single one. And when I say cold call, I mean, I did a lot of calls, but I actually interviewed every single one, like literally every single one. My project was not complete until I talked with every single one and talked meant with the key decision maker at that agency. So the larger the agency would go down, but still C level, right? So the small, the, that let's say the number 500 would be the executive director, but maybe number one would be the chief information officer, or chief technology officer. So I did that in the previous business. Um, so kind of like I was hustling back in the sixth grade, like I've always been a hustler. Um, my mom was actually an Avon lady when she first uh, moved to the country. And my dad was uh, drying cars at a car wash, was his first job before he landed a job by one of their customers who owned a pizza parlor. He went on to be uh, on the Inc. 500 three years in a row, 93, 94, 95, um, with a, a software development business, uh, go, a federal government contractor. So I think something, there's definitely something hereditary there. Um, and then I also had my own thing um, because, uh, yeah, I mean, just however I've grown up, it's, uh, some of it's yeah. hard to explain. But you see, this new one, yeah, I mean, we, we have like over 50,000 Uber drivers using our app to track their finances. Um, and how did, how did we do that is pretty interesting, but we definitely went mm -hmm. after it, those folks, uh, mostly trying to help them. So we didn't pitch them on the app at first. We actually gave them useful information, which was a guide to a uh, tax guide for Uber drivers. Now, it, it, sounds, it sounds like that, I mean, because you said, you said that you talked to the, the uh, top 500, but you didn't really like cold call them, you interviewed them. And then it almost sounds like the same thing with Uber is that, you're not you're not calling somebody and saying, "Hey, you need to buy this app." You're you're engaging the customer to find out what it is that they need, and then if you have the solution, then you connect the dots, right? I mean, that's that's fair to say. Yeah, definitely. And, Value proposition has to stand on its own. And I think that a lot of people miss that mark. I mean, even even with what we do, you know, like uh, in land investing, when we find that that buyer of the property. It's not about hard hammering them to buy. I mean, you have to ask for the order, but it's more of understanding why they want to do this. And if this is a good product for them, a good, a good property for them. And it's, it's about asking over and over and over again. It's, it's like, this is, this is what you want. It's like, stop looking. This is it. But if it's not the right property, it's not that we should just hammer them into to submission to buy something that, that's not right for them. It's, it's that we should say, okay, now that I understand what you want, I can wait until I have something in my inventory that connects that dot. And then it's like, here, just here's what you want. You told me this is what you want and this is why it's it. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. And what I think um, a lot of people want to do, and I think it's a huge mistake, is they want to be the opposite of Raj, Right. They want to come up with a, a great idea that solves a problem or they think it solves a problem, but they don't want to talk to anybody. They don't want to go through and cold call 500 people and find out and, you know, exactly what's going to solve their problem and find out, you know, what's their buyer persona because, you know, there's different personas for different customers. And unless you are going to engage on a one-to-one -one basis in the beginning, you won't know. And it's the role of the CEO to be the top sales guy from, or gal from day one. And then once you understand it intimately, then I think you can create a sales force or a sales team and get to that next level and start leveraging that. But like what you said, Scott, like if I get on a, a, a call with a, a land buyer, a potential land buyer, it's not a transaction. It's I'm, I'm looking at it like, okay, I'm going to treat this person as if, I'm going to be working with them 
their friends, their family, and I'm now their land consultant and I'm aligning with them at the other side of the table, not, Hey, you got to get this property. Like maybe it's not the right property for them. Um, some of my best customers have been total mistakes. You know what I mean? Like, I'm like I, my, my, my fault. I didn't ask you the right questions. I didn't understand that you wanted to build your dream home on this property that has no utilities. Here's a better property for you. Right. Or, you know, whatever it is. And like, Oh my gosh, you're amazing to work with. But, you know, I, you could have gone the other way and said, Hey, we got a contract, right? Whatever it is. Um, Raj, what do you, th- what do you think of that? I mean, do you, do you agree with me? Do you think the CEO of day one needs to get on the phone and, and figure out the personas? I think, uh, the best ones do. I don't think, um, that I, I certainly think there's a percentage that, that don't, that never have, and they don't operate like that. They're, um, you know, there's the saying, uh, working on your business versus working in your business. Um, that's, uh, that's something I've been seeing a lot uh, lately. And whether it's lifestyle entrepreneur, you can still hit it big. Lifestyle doesn't mean you don't hit it big necessarily. Um, but I'm more like, I like, I like both. Like I like working in and on. I think working in the business helps you to work on it, but you should like, I, I'm not, you know, my interest is always, you gotta still keep working in. Um, you can still, you can do both. Um, so I, I agree. Like you gotta, um, you have to be in touch with your customers. Like we have in-app chat in our app. Like who has a mobile app with that? Like there aren't very many. And that means we have direct access to all of our users. They can ask us questions anytime and we talk with them and I look at all those conversations so I can see what's going on. I chime in on some, but I see all the trends. Like how else? Yeah. You could put someone else there, but you keep adding on filters and, Next thing you know, you're completely filtered out and you have no idea like where you're even headed, you know, uh, and you're just relying on like analytics, but you still need to, how do you develop, like how do people develop their gut intuition? Right? They have to be involved to even develop a gut. Um, so I think, I think there's certain businesses that even if they're transactional, like we're talking, like you can, your differentiator would be, like, uh, even if you don't sell someone something and they come to you, like they'll still remember you and how you deal with them and references and referrals that like you can generate great long-term business. And I think a lot of folks just go in with like short-term thinking and short-term goals. You can have those sh- uh, short-term milestones as part of your long-term plan. Yeah, I, I love it. I love it. What, what was one of the biggest, Scott, you got a question? I'm sorry. No, I was going was to say like, it's, I think that it's so like everything that Ron was just saying is, is dead on. I mean, like, you know, you don't don't have to do something just because of you're involved in a transaction to build that customer uh, loyalty. I had a guy last week that was buying a piece of property for my competitor, not you. Uh, he was he was buying <laughs> he was buying a piece of property and he didn't know the GPS coordinates. And he asked me like, "Hey, hey is this guy a legitimate guy?" And I'm like, "He is a legitimate guy." And he said, "Well, what do you do? You know, I find the GPS coordinates in this, and I just gave him the GPS coordinates." Not anything to do, and I never even asked him, like, you know, can I, can I steal you away from this guy? And then two days later, we get we make a sale from his friend. So his friend recommended us versus the guy that he actually bought from. And I think it's like the same thing is, you know, figure out how you can add value to a transaction and even something as simple as getting someone a GPS coordinate produce a thousand dollar sale for us. Yeah. And cause you were helpful. Like right. when I, the thing is, you proposition that you're talking about. Yeah. And uh, I imagine you're probably helpful as a person in general, like inside your house, you're helpful with your family. So that's what I talk yeah. about. Like why turn it off when you walk out the front door? So you're helpful. So you should, yeah. that's your, that's your MO. So you should just always be helpful and it resonates. Like people these days, they, they want to do business with people they like. Right. Yeah, that's, that's one of the reasons I love that book, uh, Give and Take by Adam Grant. Raj, have you read that? Uh, not entirety. I've had trouble reading entire books uh, over the last few years. <laughs> I have a six-month-old now, so it's virtually impossible. Oh, that's even worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you, you have a life sentence, man. You won't man. see an adult movie or read a book for about 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> no joke. All right, so... I think we're at that point 
where we're going to ask Raj for his tip of the week, a website, a resource, a book, something actionable for the art of passive income listeners go right now, improve their businesses, improve their lives. Raj, com. what do you got? So I, my tip of the week is to focus. Um, and if you need uh, to drill down on that, then I'd say, um, since we're talking about books, the last full book I read was The One Thing by Gary Keller and Jay Papazan, and that's all about focus. Uh, but they give great examples on how they focused and some models on how you, too, you, you can too. Um, it's one of my favorite books, Raj. I talk about that book all the time. Awesome. Yeah, it's, uh, it just hits home with me. I've always focused. Uh, they take it to the next level, like no question. Fantastic. Scott Todd, what's your tip of the week? Mark, do you like accountability? I hate accountability. I, I, I argue with my wife about it all the time. My, my biggest thing is, hey, that, what, that's not me. No, I'm kidding. You know, what's funny is after I read the 10X rule, um, I, be, I believe everything is my responsibility. I'm accountable for everything. Even if it's not even in my control, it is in my control. Or I should think it's in my control. I, I yeah. feel like I'm accountable and, for everything. And in the 12-week the year, which is a great book, uh, we talk about accountability partners, right? And right. we know that, that bots are the, the latest craze around town. And I know how much you love bots. So I'm going to wrap all of this up into one free, your next favorite uh, word, bot. Ready? It's okay. goal bot. Dot co goalbot.co it is your accountability partner and it uses facebook messenger and when you sign up it gives you it asks you for your three goals like what are your three goals this month and you enter in one two three and it will follow up with you once a week to see how you're doing and keep you accountable to those goals that you put in there so I put in my three goals for the month and we'll see how, how, uh, how it does in keeping me motivated with it's, it's checking in and it's quotes, resources and other stuff. I love it. I'm all, I'm doing it right now. I do, I'm doing it right now. Raj, you said, you said monthly goals, weekly goals, annual goals, 12 week year goals. What do you do? Yep. All of that and daily. So, but not in, uh, so it wouldn't be in the, like, uh, I do it in a looser system. Uh, so it's just my own system. Um, but we even do that, like with my team, we have, uh, we have a daily stand up um, and weekly time allocation goals. Um, so we do it in a way that doesn't require like crazy tracking, but helps you focus. Like I look at my thing, my list every day, multiple times a day, because you get pulled into so many different things. So you got to be staying on target. And so one way I do that is I, like week, like before the week starts, like over the weekend, sometimes on Friday, I set my weekend, my weekly allocation, time allocation. You know, I should be spending 30% here, 50% there. And then I might break some of those down so I don't lose track of it as I get pulled into other items. Yeah, I, I use that uh, Chrome extension focus. And then, you, hit, you know, it just tells you what do you want to do today. I love it. Um, nice. All right. Well, I, I thought this was great. My tip of the week is going to be learn about Raj and how he is saving the world um, one expense at a time and saving you time and ultimately saving you money at hurdler.com. Is that correct, Raj? Yep. H-U-R-D-L-R. All right. If you're a realtor, go to profit-.com, right? Uh, profit-.co. Profit-co. That's right. All the hipsters are using. It's all that. A, yeah. It's all a hurdler anyway. You can just go to hurdler, click on realtors. Yeah. Right. Right. And um, what's interesting about Raj is that, um, like he said, like he is giving and giving and giving. So it's not just hurdlers. Not just for hey, I want the solution. Like there's tons of information on there that is just helpful information. Um, you walk away smarter, um, and that's what I love about hurdler. And I'm really just, you know, very honored and grateful, Raj, that you took time out of your extremely busy day to, uh, to share some entrepreneurial wisdom with us. So thank you so much. Yeah, I was really happy to be here. Mark and Scott, thank you guys for having me on board. All right. Fantastic. Nice. All right. We'll look at, learn more. Go to hurdler.com. 
Um, I am going to remind everybody, go to scotttodd.net, landmoto.com forward slash wholesale as well. And don't forget, today's podcast has been sponsored by LoanGeek.io. Set it and forget it. Ending. I don't know. I got to come up with a good tagline, Scott. What do you think, Raj? What, what should my tagline be for Lone Geek? For Lone Geek? Um, yeah. so you got to tell him. You got to tell him what it is. So, so we're automating. Okay, let's say, for example, like you're in real estate, right? So, um, or you're an angel investor. Okay, people, you know, they owe you money, let's say. Um, well, I guess angel investing is not really like that. Okay, but let's just say, for example, you know, use it all. Or you, or you yeah, 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 that's a bad example. But, but in real estate, for example, um, let's say that you're buying, uh, you're investing with Scott on a deal, or you know, or you're, you're, he's borrowing money from you, like you're a private money guy, and he's you're borrowing, he's borrowing hundred thousand at ten percent, right? Well, he can pay you every single month, right, through a check. But then you've got to spend your time, Raj, emailing him, reminding him instead of automating it. So what we can do is using Stripe as the back end is you set him up one time and he can log in and never does he have to say, Raj, what's my balance? He doesn't call you. So he can go in, see his balance at any time. He can make a prepayment at any time. You can charge fees, which won't affect the amortization. And it's just going to save you a lot of time. The nice thing about it is we have no note setup fees. Um, it's very inexpensive and it's awesome. Um, so accountants are going to love it. Everyone's going to love it. And we are by far, um, I, I think, the, the best solution on the market right now. Um, for, at least for small and medium-sized business. For, for big banks, we're not. But for everybody else, I think we are. So that's Lone Geek. So what's, what's your tagline uh, for me? What, uh, so your target market are, I mean, it's kind of like a market. Like land, like land note people, uh, real estate note people, and auto dealers, right? Anyone, anyone that's borrowing that, that has a borrower. Okay, but it's not the borrower, right? No, it's not the borrower. It's good for the borrower, but it's not, the borrower is not the person who's going to be our customer. Yeah, the borrower is not the one, uh, Starting, you know, starting the um, transaction. So the car dealer would be a customer? Correct. And the local bank? Uh, could be. Uh, I mean, uh, you picked loan geek, like geek, uh, yeah. to imply that it's smart? Very smart. Dare I say genius? Mm -hmm. Well, then you would have said loan genius. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Actually, you know, for Profit Dash, we actually considered Profit Genius, but to come out of the gates with Profit Genius would to be to set the expectations so high that if you don't meet it anywhere, then you could never live up to, like, that's it. You're, like, done, basically. Right. Um, I think something with smart... Um, if you're going for like with smart, you could do it where it's not necessarily completely functional uh, versus automated. If you want to go the functional route. Got it. Um, like, yeah, like functional smart, be, smart lending automated. Yeah. No, not both. Uh, either. Uh, I would only do one yeah. Yeah, smart, smart lending. The smart way to track who owes you money. Simple. Simple. I like it. It's a little wordy, Scott. Yeah, or seamless loan tracking. That's functional. All right. Well, look, we got some ideas. All right. Well, I want to thank all the listeners. <laughs> look, the only way we're going to get the types of guests like oh, that was live. <laughs> right, right. Is, <laughs> is to, uh, I know. We're very informal. Is to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. And look, you just saw a fly on the wall of a brainstorming session with Raj Bosker. So, um, hurdler.com, Raj, thanks again. Scott Todd, thanks again. And we'll see everybody next time. Take care, Mark. Take care.